ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another installation of the Certified Fitness Coordinator, brought to you by Salt Lake City Fire Department under the authority of having jurisdiction. Today's lesson, as you can see, is injury prevention, and your host is none other than the most sought-after PowerPoint presenter of all time, the highly regarded Richard Platt, Station 3, A Platoon. Uh, we're coming to you live. Just kidding. This is previously recorded. But I'm going to do no remakes at all on all the slides. If I make a mistake, you get the mistake. Um, we're just going to be real and in your face this time on injury prevention. This is my second time doing it. So hopefully I'm very well rehearsed by now. Um, I think we have about 30 slides. So we're all going to do this together. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the topic of injury prevention with my opinion on the topic. And that is, if you want to prevent injury, I would suggest that you be harder to injure. So that is a simple concept, but hard to do in real life. Um, we're going to talk about how we can do our best on that through the rest of this podcast. We're going to address the who, the what, the how, the why of injury. We're going to talk about what gets injured and how. We're going to talk about why we get injured and what the difference is between an acute injury and a chronic injury, which is sometimes called an overuse injury. After we've spent a few minutes talking about the mechanics and pathophysiology of hurting ourselves, I'd like to go over what we as CFCs should know when it comes to working with an injured person. We better start with this disclaimer. So, we are not doctors. Maybe one of us is a doctor. We're not, we're definitely not scientists. Some of us barely graduated recruit school or paramedic school. When people hurt themselves or if we find someone at the station with limited range of motion in the shoulder, it is out of our scope of practice to diagnose their problem or provide a solution. The best thing we can do is recommend or refer to a professional such as an MD or rehab specialist. So again, CFCs do not diagnose or treat injuries. As defined in the IFF Peer Fitness Trainer Manual, on page 297, an injury occurs when the capacity or tolerance of a tissue is exceeded by the demands placed upon it. The demands are the applied load. It is important to know that tissue tolerance and the applied load can be modified by the way we move. A fit person is harder to injure and has an increased ability and therefore has an increased ability to resist injury. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of capacity and load. If you step into the squat rack, load the barbell on your back and get ready to squat, the load is the barbell. And the tissue, because the barbell is on your back, is pretty much your whole body. But in this case, it's primarily your back, hips, and legs. So depending on how you squat, be it a low bar squat or high bar squat, or if you're squatting with a kettlebell or just doing air squats, the tissue tolerance can be modified by the way you move. If you have a really bad squat with really bad knee position, the tissue of your knees are going to have poor tolerance and they're going to be easier to injure. No PowerPoint presentation is complete without a set of statistics. So let's go over some important statistics that pertain to us and injury. Every two years or so, the NFPA releases injury an injury report, and the recent trend reveals that most firefighters are injured on the fire ground. Now, that's 39% of firefighter injuries. So that is a large number. Almost half of all injuries happen during some type of emergency response. The types of injuries topping the charts are what you might expect, and they include injuries to the back, shoulders, and knees. So again, the most common place of places that firefighters get injured are the back, shoulders, and knees. I think almost everyone on the job has some type of chronic pain or condition 
however minor it may be, to this area. And if you don't, then you will. The NFPA goes on to predict how many injuries a department like Salt Lake City or our similar size would have in a year. So according to the 2010 United States Census of Salt Lake City, there are 186,000 people, over 186,000 people living in Salt Lake City. We're in FEMA Region 8, and the NFPA reports that fire departments in this area experience about 13 and a half injuries. I think that's per year. And they further reiter further uh, explain this and predict that there would be about two to almost four injuries per every 100 fires. We Salt Lake City had 6,786 fire calls in Salt Lake City, so those are not all working fire calls, otherwise we'd be having a lot of injuries. I think that tracking firefighter injuries is an area of improvement that we can make on the job, and maybe that's something that we could tackle as CFCs or at least be very involved in uh, monitoring that information so that we can use it. If we track injuries, then we can see what possibly see where people are lacking physically fitness wise as, uh, as a whole department and then prescribe changes from there. No, this is not a photograph of a hobo in January at Pioneer Park. That's just a photo of Captain Galky, actually retired Captain Galky, enjoying his retirement. Some of you may or may not know him, but before his retirement, his uh, he was plagued by complications of back pain, and he ended up having to have a pretty involved back surgery prior to his retirement. So I, I put this picture in here, and I bring him up, uh, not to pick up on him, but I want to use him a little bit as an example. An injury can complicate your career and your retirement. And I hope that we can give people some information about how to avoid injury just to have the best career and the best retirement. He had to leave the job a little bit because he was ready to. I think he had somewhere around 30 years on the job. And he had to leave a little bit because he had to because his back was just too bad. So injuries incurred on the fire ground, while severe, are not the only ones that we as health and fitness advocates should be worried about. The men and women on our job are generally very active people. They work out on their days off and they go on sweet vacations with their families. Our members are prone to injure themselves both on and off the job. So I don't want to think uh, that our clients are only firefighters. I think that we as the SLCFD Fitness Committee should also address and be advocates for injury prevention no, no matter where our people are going or what they're doing. The goal of this program is to help members maintain their health and fitness to respond as well as retire. We should strive to reduce injuries to the people, not just them as firefighters. If you're injured at home, you can't serve at the station. If you're injured at work, that will affect your quality of life at home. There are no silos, no one's alone, no one's independent. I would like us to consider a holistic approach. Many fire ground injuries are acute, meaning they happen right there. These could be injuries as a result of falling, tripping, slipping, spraining an ankle, or having something big and fall and hit you on the top of the head, like another firefighter. A concussion or a broken bone are obvious examples of acute injuries. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that the vast majority of our injuries or the pain that we experience are chronic injuries. A chronic injury is a result of long-term use of poor movements. And chronic injuries happen like acute injuries, but they just take longer. Uh, when the tolerance of the tissues are no longer able to resist the demand that the load is putting on the body or that tissue. Now let's say if someone were to lift and move a heavy object and suddenly experience severe pain in the lower back. It might be tempting to say, well I guess old Jerry slipped a disc then and consider this to be an acute back injury because this was the first time that his back injury 
uh, his back started to hurt him. Many injuries incurred are acute worsenings of chronic issues. Compare this to an asthma attack or a COPD exacerbation. They have asthma and COPD all the time, but it only bothers them when they exercise or when they smell something funny that someone was cooking. Jerry, in this case, has been lifting and moving so bad for so long that today, on the fire, was finally the day that it got the best of him. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, or... In this case, Jerry's back. Jerry, unfortunately, was not hard to injure. Jerry was sedentary, he moved poorly, and he was a human that was very easy to injure. The initial phase of injury is the inflammatory phase, or the acute phase. Injury is characterized by inflammation. And inflammation may be the underlying cause of pain. This is normal uh, and is expected to be part of your training, actually hurting and having some inflammation. It's part of recovery in the normal healing process. Acute inflammation could last days to weeks, depending on location and the severity of the injury. Obviously, long-term chronic inflammation, there's going to be a problem there. Although these phases of inflammation may last weeks at a time, continued repair and remodeling of muscle and other tissues will continue for months. The primary objective of the remodeling phase is to return to a level of training that is required by the demands of our job. During all phases of injury and recovery, it is important that we as the CFCs collaborate with medical and rehab personnel to ensure that physical training does not compromise our client's recovery. So for example, we may have a trainee that's on days due to an injury to their back or shoulder, and they come in to the PSB and they say, hey, I just went to my physical therapist yesterday and they gave me these exercises. Could you help me with them? I would love it if we have, as CFCs, were doing that more often, either in the stations with people or uh, if they were on days at the PSB or at training or wherever they happen to be working out for that time period. My catchphrase for this PowerPoint is be hard to injure. If you want to avoid injury, this PowerPoint is about injury prevention. If you want to avoid injury, be harder to injure. Um, I want to talk to you about this concept that is in the Peer Fitness Trainer Manual that we passed out at a training a few months ago and that is movement matters so we're going to discuss a little bit in this example of the relationship between how we move the load we're trying to move and the tolerance or the strength of our tissues so lifting with a flex spine bending your hunching your shoulders over and making your spine flexed increases the opportunity for injury Carrying objects with your shoulders in bad position, which is down and forward, increases the opportunity for injury. One of the most frequent examples I see of bad shoulder position is lifting a stretcher. Now, I know a lot of us are very good in our abilities in able to avoid lifting the stretcher, but Take a moment and notice whoever's at the foot of the stretcher lifting it into the ambulance. Notice their shoulder position. See that it is down and forward. They often also have a flexed, flexed spine or they're trying to lift a little bit higher. And so they have an extended lumbar spine. Now, on top of that, their body is under load because they're holding the patient and trying to move the stretcher into the ambulance. This is a very bad position. Um, we're going to go over just a quick little example here about something that I think all of us have been involved in. Imagine that a paramedic stands behind an obese patient, applies his grip under the armpits and upon the wrists in the fashion of a Rogers carry. This patient is very heavy, but the paramedic is strong enough, which I'm using in quotations, the paramedic is strong enough to apply force and move the patient. To do so, the paramedic is driving their hips up, like 
you would if you were lifting a heavy sandbag off the ground. And the patient moves verti vertically. Their butt raises just a little bit off the ground vertically. While this is happening, the paramedic's back is transferring the load from their arms to the hips. Okay, so the patient is the load and that weight is transferring from the paramedic's arms through their back to the hips. The hips are like the engine that are lifting this load off the ground. The patient is very heavy and in this case the paramedic does not have a strong back. This is seen as evident when the back begins to curve or flex. The load applied to the paramedic's back is beginning to exceed the capacity of the muscle tissues. So the patient is too heavy and the paramedic is not strong enough actually. We know the paramedic is actually not strong enough because the back is flexed. So the param Oops, yep, I told you I'm not going to edit this. I just stumbled. We get a uh, uncut, raw, unfiltered. I'm just going to start reading my comments again. So we know it is too difficult for the patient to the paramedic to lift the patient because the paramedic can't maintain a neutral spine. So this paramedic is easy to injure. The way we move is so important. So to further drive home, drive the point home of how movement matters and how good movements will make you hard to injure, I'd like to talk a little bit about the functional movement screening, otherwise known as the FMS, and the Wellness Fitness Initiative 7 key features. So we had a training regarding both of these where we at least talked about them a little bit. We have a handout known as the seven key features. This is put out by the IFF in their peer fitness trainer curriculum. So the FMS is a seven step strength and flexibility assessment that we have been using at peak. I say all the time, I love the FMS because it's a good tool for assessing your strengths as well as weaknesses and prescribing uh, physical fitness routines. It's also pretty decent in demonstrating how um, firefighters improve over the years. Right now I'm working on my cardio <laughs> and my body fat. Um, the FMS has some pretty good research under its belt now and it has been shown that it can predict injury in athletes that have low FMS scores. So a few years ago I did have a low score in my shoulder, low and bold. I developed a rotator cuff impingement so um, I'm prone to shoulder inflammation and acute shoulder pain if I don't watch where I'm putting my shoulders when I lift and move. So it is possible to be fit and move poorly because there are some college athletes I mean they're obviously fit but when they get low FMS scores it's easy they get hurt because they're moving bad on the field. Just because you're fast doesn't mean you move well and just because you're strong doesn't mean you move well either. So the second point here, the seven key features, that can be used as a coaching template. It's from the IFF, developed in their Wellness Fitness Initiative. We also talk about this in the assessment program, the assessment class that we're putting on in this program. And it can serve as a model for how to move. Basically, you can perform almost any task with as much safety as possible if while you move you adhere to these seven key features and we've touched on them before and I'll just re quickly go over them now when you move your knees should maintain a straight path in line over the foot meaning your knees are not tracking laterally this is called frontal plane movement back and forth when you're squatting or lunging the back when you're lifting, pulling, pushing, in all cases, the back should not be twisting. The back should not be hunching forward, creating a flex spine, and you, the back should not be should not be extended uh, like a pregnant lady. I don't have any pictures here. Maybe I should add some pictures to show examples of this. But I know we had a handout in wit that all the current CFCs have, and we've talked about this before, I'm just reviewing it now. And the shoulders, when lifting, pulling, pushing, climbing, anytime the shoulders are under load, the best position for the shoulders is down and back. Again, look at how people lift the stretcher under load, 
those shoulders are always down and forward. We need to redesign the stretchers for those pull, poor gold crossers. All those young people are going to bust their shoulders. As referenced in the previous slide, here we have the seven key features which were developed by the IAFF Wellness Fitness Initiative for the Peer Fitness Trainer Certification. This can be used as a template for coaching movement patterns of a trainee, and I also take these into consideration for my own training as well. We should strive to always maintain these positions while moving. Notice that the underlying theme of these positions is neutrality. Look at the knee. The knee is in a neutral position over the foot. The spine is neutral. It is not flexed nor extended, nor extended. And also, the shoulders, down and back, are in a tight, neutral position. I would recommend to everyone that you become familiar with this chart and apply it to your own training and coaching practices. Being strong will assist in improving your tissue tolerance and help one better accommodate optimal movement patterns while under load. It is not the only way to avoid injury, but I think that it is nonetheless fundamental for avoiding injury and just generally doing our jobs. I appreciate this quote from Mark Ripto, who was a pioneer in the strength training community and movement training programs I've heard started to kill in general. To the above an injury, past injury, I have an ongoing shoulder problem. Because of this, I am I'm predisposed to injury. After diagnosed with a rotator cuff impingement, and yeah, now I am prone shoulder, which I just refer to now as flare-ups of pain. Maintaining your shoulder in a position is a position B. I'm dragging the sand back. Shoulder is. I neglected to mention this in the first slide, but um, in the NFPA report regarding injury that came out in 2016, the number one cause of injury is overexertion. So what does overexertion really mean? That is when someone becomes fatigued, the muscle loses its ability contra to contract, and from there a breakdown in form is observed. So if you were working um, an axe, a pike pole, carrying a ladder, and you were tired, there goes a breakdown in form of your shoulders or your back starts to flex because it's tired and you're trying to redistribute weight just in an area that's more comfortable for you. Well, as your form breaks down, you have poor movement, you're opening yourself up for injury. Poor, when you get tired, you become more easy to injure. It's easier to injure you when you're tired. And who's injuring you? The environment. And bad guys. A ligament sprain is a certain type of injury and it's usually a very acute injury associated with a traumatic event like a fall or something that happened during a contact sport firefighting is a contact sport so the most common joints for sprains include the ankle i think almost every human being on the planet has sprained the ankle i think i sprained my ankle 40 times when i was a kid um also don't forget the thumb fingers and shoulder it's very debilitating to have a sprained finger it's really limiting not to be able to have that strong grip on something so yeah limit ligament sprains are often associated with traumatic injuries or some type of blunt trauma and so most of the time these are acute in nature the point at which you experience a muscle strain may be acute as well um, a muscle strain is a situation where the muscle has become overloaded and suffers a microscopic tear. So back to the idea that we started with at the beginning of this PowerPoint of tissue tolerance. A muscle strain is an, the breakdown of, our, of the tissue tolerance. The tissue can't tolerate any more weight and it begins to tear. So it is so important to remember that movement matters and having poor form or being ignorant of what good form is can cause undue loading and stress upon joints and muscles. Let's go over an example here about elbow pain. I experienced elbow pain too because I was climbing like an idiot when I was 20 um, and loading the crap out of my elbow joints with my whole body. So, but lots of people have come to have mentioned to me that they have elbow pain also. They say, I've 
elbow pain when I bench press, or they say they have elbow pain when they do pull-ups. The elbow is a very interesting joint because it is affected by the muscles distal and proximal to it. So it's affected by the muscles in your upper arm and it's affected by the muscles below it in your forearm. Whenever you load the arms, whether you're doing a bench press, a pull-up, or a bicep curl, you can do three things with your wrist. The wrist can flex, extend, or remain neutral. So flexing your wrist, looking at your hand, make a fist, move the fist towards your face. Ex extension of the wrist is going to be away from your base. Anytime you're flexing or extending the wrist, you're loading the muscles in your arm and then you're putting undue stress on the ligaments in your elbow joint. This is what leads to um, elbow tendonitis and climbers experience this, tennis players experience this. It's very important that when you're doing a bench press or pull-ups as much as possible, maintain a neutral wrist. That will keep um, undue force being transferred to the elbow. Overuse conditions frequently lead to chronic inflammation. So like the last example that we talked about, frequently using your elbows, elbows poorly by flexing or extending the wrist can lead to chronic inflammation in the elbows. And while you might not suffer acute um, devastating tissue damage, that does increase the opportunity for that to occur with um, excessive loads applied in your movements with that bad, with that poor movement. One piece of information we can pass on to the CFCs and people in the fire department to help them avoid injury and to help them be harder to injure themselves is when they start a new program, start low and progress slow. So start low in the weight and progress very slowly. Too many times I have to remind people their ego is not their amigo. Let's just add five pounds a week or maybe even two and a half pounds per week to our lifts. Rotator cuff impingement or shoulder impingement syndrome, subacromial impingement, swimmer shoulder and thrower shoulder is a clinical syndrome which occurs when the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles become irritated and inflamed as they pass through the subacromial space, the passage beneath the acromion. And take note of this picture on the left there that is a very small space. So when you have inflammation there, there's not a lot of room for the tendons and they become to be pinched or impinged. So this re can result in pain, weakness, and loss of movement at the shoulder. I keep coming back to this as an example because of my specific experience with it. A few years ago, the day after the TPT, I was experiencing pretty severe pain in my neck, shoulder, and back. I went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with rotator cuff impingement. After several weeks of physical therapy, I started to feel better and I feel great today. However, unless I maintain strict form while pressing, deadlifting, anything requiring the use of my shoulder, I am still prone to pain. Overall, this took a long time to heal. So I think we should also take this opportunity to address the movement pattern of pressing, such as push-ups or bench pressing. A common mistake in performing push-ups is when at the bottom of the movement or when the chest is near the floor, the shoulders have been put in the position of up and forward. This reduces the tolerance of your shoulder tissue. Second is the bench press. A common mistake when performing the flat bench press is when at the bottom of the movement or when the bar is closest to the chest, the shoulders again have been placed in position of up and forward. The change that I would recommend to both of these movements is to A, maintain a neutral wrist in the bench press. One should utilize a closed grip and straight wrists, not an extended wrist, not an open grip extended wrist. Whenever possible, I like to use those push-up handles, like the push -up, perfect push-up product, which I have pictured here. And B, move your hands closer to your body and down the torso for push-ups. 
The second change I would suggest for flat bench presses is changing the bar path from down to an area above your nipples or close to your neck to down your torso and close, closer to the bottom of your rib cage. Uh, changing both of these movement patterns does the same thing. It puts your shoulders in a position of down and back, which increases their tissue tolerance and therefore reduces the opportunity for injury. The most frequently reported knee injury is damage to the meniscus. Just a quick reminder, the meniscus is that cartilaginous pad in the middle of your knee. These injuries are characterized by twisting under load and can be accompanied by other types of injuries such as ACL tear. You should have noticed that twisting of the knee under load is not in adherence to the seven key features of which strongly recommend maintaining the knee in line over the top of the foot. Your first assumption of bone fractures is that they may be fundamentally acute. However, that is not always the case. Take, for example, stress fractures, which are extremely common in the armed forces basic training setting and are attributed to excessive running, especially in untrained individuals. I would like to take this opportunity to drive home the importance of strength training or otherwise the intelligent application of training good movements under progressively increased loads. Google the starting strength novice progression for a good example of this. Strength training does not only improve the size and work capacity of muscles, but bone density as well. I think strength training for women is especially important as they are susceptible to osteoporosis. So strength training should be um, an important part for women to increase that bone density to avoid osteoporosis in later years of life. We have now covered several types of injury from muscle strains to more specific injuries like shoulder impingements and meniscal tears. We are now going to lead into appropriate remedies and actions following an injury. This is a good opportunity to remind everyone again that it is not our job as certified fitness coordinators to diagnose anyone's injury or provide a treatment plan for said injury. When in doubt, refer it out. It is within our scope to consult and work with experts in regards. For example, a firefighter with an injured shoulder may go to a specialist and then get referred to physical therapy. The specialist will diagnose the problem and the physical ther therapist will prescribe treatment plans and recovery a recovery program. So it would be in our sco scope to consult with the physical therapist in regard to what exercises or activities the recovering firefighter can perform. Or another example, let's say there is a firefighter on light duty and you have been assigned to help them with an exercise plan. This firefighter tells you that they have been going to physical therapy for three weeks and shows you a list of exercises the physical therapist has prescribed to them. It would be appropriate to monitor the firefighter's exercise routine and coach them with their movements. Fitness coordinators should be aware of the prolific use of NSAIDs by firefighters. Long-term use of NSAIDs may not be beneficial for recovery and some research suggests it may even inhibit muscle growth, or cause GI problems. Long-term use here is considered to be longer than five days. Short-term use does not delay the healing of soft tissues. Refer to the TSAC manual, page 435, for more information. Following an injury, the need for protection is vital to prevent any worsening. This is the same principle as to why we splint extremities in the field prior to transport. The use of price or protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation in sport medicine, although lacking in research, is still widely used and generally accepted. These steps are a strategy for reducing and limiting the ill effects of acute inflammation. Personally, I often make use of wrist wraps to assist in maintaining a neutral rest, neutral wrist when, do, do, when doing my pressing exercises. Protect yourself before you wreck yourself. So 
We're winding down and getting ready to wrap up this lesson. Again, I need to drive home one of the underlying themes of this PowerPoint, and that is the concept that we are not experts and we should not be diagnosing or attempting to fix any serious injuries. When in doubt, refer a trainee or other client to a professional such as a doctor or physical therapist. One point of interest to note is that PEHP allows us, I believe, 12 visits per year to a physical therapist, and we no longer have to have a doctor's referral to do this. I've personally found physical therapy to be very useful. Reasons that would be necessary for referral include, but of course not limited to, chronic pain, severe pain, immobility or decreased range of motion, swelling, if someone tells you that they experience a popping or tearing sensation, and especially the inability to perform normal job functions. Summary. This is my favorite part of any training ever assigned to me in Target Solutions because it means that we are almost done. Hooray. So, some items to review. The majority of firefighter injuries occur on the fire ground and are a result of overexertion. The most common injuries occur to the back, knees, and shoulder. That is why I love referring to the WFI 7 key features that, re that we reviewed in slide number 13 in my coaching and individual training practices. The injuries to the back, knees, and shoulders can be further reduced to muscle strains, ligament sprains, and tendonitis. These injuries are probably acute exacerbations characterized by chronic poor movement under excessive loads. Diagnosis and treatment of injury is better left to the professionals, but that doesn't mean that we can't play an important role in the prevention and recovery process. In actuality, I believe that we, as certified fitness coordinators, are playing the most important role, that being of education and dissemination of information. Lead by example by promoting good movements and not letting your ego interfere with workouts and physical performance on the fire ground. Your ego is not your amigo. People, men especially, as we know, have a tendency to minimize symptoms which may be suggestive of a serious medical problem such as heart attack or stroke. I think that we all have been on calls in which valuable time was lost because the patient was too proud to acknowledge that something serious was taking place, which then resulted in death or permanent disability. Heart attacks and strokes are the best example here. An injury occurs when the tissue tolerance is overcome by an applied load. This can happen acutely or chronically. Good movement increases the tissue's tolerance of a load. So the message that I would like to close with is this. Be hard to injure. Being strong increases the tolerance of your tissues by increasing the size and work capacity of your muscles and increasing bone density as well. In the words of the functional movement screening, I would also like to say, moving well and moving often will make you harder to injure.